we're ready for our CCO student webinar. We're on number 68 and there is some questions that had recently come in that we're going to answer from our students. Uh, hello to everybody that's visiting us live. Uh, we had questions about modifiers. That's something that is uh, there's a little bit of a learning curve on modifiers. You need to know them for both real world coding, of course, and testing. But what everybody struggles with is, well, when do we actually use the modifiers? And so that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Now, our uh, CCO student webinars are a little more casual. Uh, make sure you put in the chat anything that pops up that you want to ask a question about and I may stop and answer it but or we'll save them to the end. I've got lots of things that I'm going to show you in reference tonight about the um, that, that resources that you can use. The first thing you need to be aware of when you're going to use the modifiers in medical coding is what's the actual purpose of the modifier? Why do we use them? Ultimately, it just helps tell the story. So every time that you have a visit with a provider and a patient, it is telling a story. The provider is going to do an evaluation and a management of the patient, an e and &M, and the patient's going to tell the provider, you know, what the problem is or what's uh, occurring, uh, whether it be positive or negative, maybe they're doing better with their diabetes or maybe they're struggling with depression uh, or they're there for refills on their medication or they need their annual wellness visit or it's a, a you know, a work physical. It doesn't matter. It's as soon as they walk in that door, there's a story to be told. And we translate that documentation into a code set so that we can capture it statistically. But also, that's how our providers are reimbursed, both with the CPT codes and the ICD codes. The modifiers help tell the rest of the story. It lets you know that there's going to be something about that code that we're using that we're translating that's a little bit different. So again, from the time they walk in, the story starts and then all the documentation that occurs, we're, we're putting that into a code set so that it could, it can be saved. And, you know, maybe you could think of a modifier as in the story being uh, additional adjectives or the like. So when we look at the, the use of the modifiers, First, we need to know the purpose. What's the purpose of every single modifier that we see in the CPT manual? Now, there's modifiers in your HixPix manual too, but once you understand the way the modifiers in your CPT manual work, uh, HixPix is just an extension off of CPT, so it will work exactly the same way. <clears throat> so know the purpose and then we need to know the type of modifier. So the purpose of our modifiers, they're going to be for increasing funds, right? You did more work. So therefore, we're going to increase the funds or decreasing the funds. We intended to get to this point in the scope, but we weren't able to due to a mass. And so we wouldn't be reimbursed for what the intent was uh, or needed to get a claim paid. We have to be able to append the modifier to tell the rest of the story. Sometimes modifiers are just informational to let you know uh, what's happening in the scenario so that you know why we're using two codes uh, back to back when you know why did they come back into the OR to do the same procedure that you just did well because they had a complication and we needed to bring them back in and open them up and look at them now let's talk about the types of modifiers that there are we've got global package modifiers what that means is 
whenever you have a procedure, it's going to be either a simple procedure that's going to have a 10 day global package or uh, a, a more complex procedure that'll have a 90 day global package. And so if say you um, had cut your, your hand and you go in and you have stitches, you know, the, then it's a 10 days, every, you know, everything that they do to put those stitches in and take care of that wound is encompassed in 10 days. Uh, <clears throat> so if you have problems, then you come back and that's all included to take care of that wound. But if you have, say, a um, hysterectomy, okay, that's 90 days. So every, the care that it is happening to the patient that had that procedure done, there's a 90 day global uh, period for that procedure where everything's encompassed in the care of that one procedure. There's bundling or CCI edits. So that would be uh, wanting to break out something that was bundled together or bundle something together. Some can only be appended to evaluation and management codes. Some will just tell numbers. In other words, we had to use two surgeries. Two, I mean, excuse me. We had one surgery, but we had to have two surgeons uh, to, to do this procedure. So then the modifier explains that. Uh, there are some modifiers that are only used for anesthesia. And then same for labs. And then, of course, there's always something that we like to call um, uh, other. And usually other is defined by the code set, even with e &M and modifiers is, you know, we have a, a definition, we have specificity, there's just not something to describe it or a code, um, you know, to describe it. Okay. If you want more information about modifiers, we have a freebies area on the cco.us website. And in that freebies area, if you go down to the bottom, there's CPT modifiers, a modifier grid that Laureen created. And I'm go we're going to talk about it. I'm going to show it to you really quick. But uh, know that you can go in, you can download that yourself. It's something free that we give you. But this is what it looks like. We'll come and reference it again in a little bit. Notice that the information that I just told you about global packages and e &M and anesthesia and lab, that's all there in description. And I'm going to tell you about those arrows uh, as well, but not right now. Let's talk more about those individual modifiers. <clears throat> Excuse me. Modifier 24, that is a very common 24, 25. Both of those are pretty common modifiers. In fact, they're modifiers that we usually start teaching on. Modifier uh, 26 is one of the first ones that that I know I teach the students. But let's talk about 24. Now let's read the description. It's an unrelated uh, evaluation or e &M service by the same physician or it could be another qualified care professional during a post-operative period. What's the type? Well, what does it do? It affects global package and it also is an e &M. You would only append it to an e &M code. That's important to know. So what does it mean? Okay, so we do an e &M, and it's during a post-operative period, meaning 10 days or 90 days, for a reason that's unrelated to the original procedure. So you went in, you had a hysterectomy. There's a 90-day global period for that procedure. And you, uh, after 20 days, you go in and you see the provider and he ends up doing another e &M. It's in the post-operative period because it's in the 90-day window, but it doesn't have anything to do with your, your hysterectomy. Okay, then you would append a 24, modifier 24 on there to indicate that, hey, I did some, the provider did something separate from the global period and the hysterectomy. You have to do that 
or when you send that off the codes translated as everything that you do for that patient during that 90 days is related to that hysterectomy unless you tell us otherwise and the modifier 24 would do that for you <clears throat> I get my arrows and after I share a screen it won't work. Uh, okay so when uh, when are you going to use a modifier 24? We need to think of each modifier this way. Now I didn't do that. Tonight we're not going to look at every single one of the modifiers because if we were to do that we would be here for quite some time. Um, Sarah asked a question, she says, if a patient has a disease and wound, uh, can we bill an ENM and a closure? Okay, first of all, Sarah, a disheasance is an opening of a surgical wound. So it would not be a separate ENM. It would be in the global package because it would be part of the care of say a hysterectomy. So uh, the hysterectomy scar usually goes this way. Uh, sometimes they do it you know up and down but <clears throat> if they go across and let's say uh, again a disheasance would be where it opens up and and uh, the suture pops or whatever and it doesn't close and those can be really deep uh, because again they cut you open, kind of flayed you uh, in a way, and then that pops open. But why did it do that? Because of the suturing, or the, the sutures of the surgical wound, right? So it's in the 90 days of the uh, closure. So you cannot, you cannot bill for that. That's a complication related to the procedure that was done. Uh, uh, that's the same thing as if a person has a cast and they put you know pins or whatever they took care of a, a fracture and then you go in because the, the the cast is rubbing and your arm or whatever has swollen or your skin is being irritated due to the cast and they decide to take the cast off remove the cast and put another one on or decide to splint you or something that's all part of the global package and so it cannot be charged again or uh, as a modifier 24. <clears throat> this uh, look at ways to use modifier 24. Now where I got this information was off of find a code but find a code's source um, I went ahead and put in our resource on the very last page of the slide deck so our CCO uh, club members they have access to this and uh, again like all club members the perk is that you get the slide deck you get the links you get the transcription as well as um, the video and continued conversation in the club but uh, okay back to modifier 24 if you append a modifier 24 it has to be put on an ENM code and it can be an unrelated ENM but Note here, service beginning the day after a procedure, okay, when the ENM is performed by the same physician mm -hmm, during the 10 or 90 day post operative period, meaning, like the example Sarah, Sarah had, was what if we have a disheasance? Okay, well, that's part of the post operative period. That's a complication, a post op complication. So you wouldn't use a, an ENM for that, okay? Now, what you could use it for is if the patient came in and they're looking and they see oh yeah there's a disheasance here we're going to address that right so that that's part of the whole package and then the doctor looks at the patient's abdomen and says well when when did that rash pop up and you say oh I'm not sure um, I noticed it a day ago well is it did it start when you started the antibiotic I gave you? And they say, no, I've taken that antibiotic before and I've taken the antibiotic several days. I just noticed this pop up, you know, um, uh, yesterday, but I'm allergic to, you know, um, strawberries. Or, or they could say, you know what, I stepped outside and um, there was poison ivy or whatever, whatever. And that's not related to the procedure. And the doctor says, you know what, we need to probably address that because that could affect 
your wound. It's on your abdomen. And um, so let me go ahead and prescribe for you a steroid. And um, let's keep an eye on that. Uh, that would be a separate e and it, It's the same doctor. It's in the post-operative period. But it has nothing to do with the procedure that you had. Okay. And so, therefore, it would um, append a modifier 2024 20, to get reimbursed for that. Uh, on an ENM, if documentation indicates the service was exclusively for treatment of the underlying condition and not for the post operative care. So, what would be the, uh, <clears throat> the underlying condition? Well, let's go back to our patient that has a hysterectomy. Okay. Why did they have a hysterectomy? Maybe they had uh, adhesions and they had endometriosis. Okay. Uh, well, they took out the uterus and they may have tried to burn off some of the endometriosis in the abdomen. But endometriosis is, uh, well, they don't necessarily know what all it's caused by or whatever. But let's say that for some reason, uh, they he's going to give you an additional uh, treatment or care for endometriosis. Well, that is not part of the procedure of the hysterectomy, even though it's the underlying cause of the hysterectomy. Okay, so it's separate. That would be acceptable. Um, e and M code when the same physician is managing immunosuppressant therapy during the post -offer, off operative period of a transplant. So whenever a patient gets a transplant, they are um, put on immunosuppressant medication, and they'll have to take that for the rest of their life. So let's say we have a kidney transplant, and then um, the uh, patient comes in and they are looking at the patient post transplant, that's 90 days, but they're not, they're not doing anything that has to do with the surgery and the procedure itself uh, or the CKD or whatever in stage renal disease that caused them to have that. What the provider is going to do is manage the medication that's separate. They're on long-term use of anti -im or an immunosuppressant drug therapy, and which is like Z79.811 or, or something like that. Okay, so that the ENM that he would do for that uh, managing that would be different. Uh, Sarah says, "No problem. I'm a derm coder, and my providers try to add it because they reevaluated the care and then had to decide a new treatment plan." Nope. Not if it's in the global period, right? And that's right, because they don't understand either. They think, well, this is something new and different. No, it's a direct result of the procedure, and it's in the global package. And yeah, that would be a, a classic um, uh, scenario. The only thing that you could uh, caveat to that is, let's say they had um, two different surgeries or procedures done by two separate providers and uh, because of their derm they address not the procedure they did that they're in the global period but what the other provider did and they look and there's a dishesance on the other provider or the other procedure and they said yeah we can we can treat that that would be an additional e &M because it's separate it's something different than what uh, what they're doing for their e &M. Mm. We almost need somebody to sit down and think up scenarios, right? All day long, you know, you could get paid really well to do that. Uh, let's look at the next one. Uh, same physician managing chemotherapy during a post uh, uh period. So a uh, patient has a bilateral mastectomy due to breast cancer and um, the patient's on chemo, right? So in the 90 days, the management, if they have any management of the chemo, that would not be there uh, the same as um, the mastectomy procedure. And then unrelated critical care. So uh, the patient has a, uh, a critical care scenario, they throw a pulmonary embolism. 
after a procedure or they get a blood clot right after a procedure that's a uh, unrelated critical care that would be appropriate so when do we not use modifier 24 now you have to think this through for every single modifier you know why would you use it why would you not use it so if we did an ENM for surgical complications or an infection or a disease uh, that's part of the surgical package. Uh, don't use it if for things like removing of sutures, a cast removal, things like that. That's all included in that global period uh, surgical package. If the surgeon admits a patient to a skilled facility or for a condition related to the surgery, so the patient has a uh, hip replacement and they're not up and mobile yet and they need to go to a skilled facility to um, uh, get therapy because they can't do the therapy at home, then again, wouldn't be applicable. That's all part of the, the procedure. Uh, medical record documentation clearly indicates the ENM was unrelated to the surgery. You know, don't use it unless it's there. That's another difficult thing for our providers to understand that they can't just use a modifier to append to the ENM and say, well, that explains it. No, you have to have it in the documentation uh, to tell why you're going to use modifier 24. Um, Mary says, what if the patient goes to their PCP for removal of stitches, but the PCP did not put them in? Well, remember in the previous said same physician. So that would not be the same physician. So they could use an ENM for that. Yep. Very good, Mary. That's a question that gets asked pre pretty often, but it's that same physician. Uh, let's see, uh, outside the post-op period of the procedure, so after the 10 days or after the 90 days, then you can, or the same day as the procedure. So uh, again, if you're you would not use it if you're doing something, you know, on the same day of the procedure. You wouldn't use the modifier 24. Everything that happens to that patient that day <clears throat> falls under that, <laughs> that, uh, you know, code. Now, what would happen if we needed to use more than one ENM to tell the whole story? Then we have an example that's given you have a major surgery you're within the global period and you have an unrelated ENM visit um, if the provider determines that he needs to do a minor surgery or other procedure it was necessary okay that would mean that one you would end up with a modifier 24 and you'd end up with a modifier 25 why because the ENM is unrelated to the original procedure and modifier 24 is going to be appended to the ENM service and the modifier 25 is going to identify it as hey I'm doing another procedure and it's separately identifiable Okay, so that is an, another reason to use that one. Now, you could actually use modifier 79 possibly to state that it's not related to the major surgery. Um, that is one that you have to see which fits better. And uh, Jane says, you cannot use more than five modifiers, right, on a claim line. That's correct. Yeah, there's a, there's a rule in there. I don't think they've changed that. Um, I seem to, I've been doing this so long that I was thinking that at one point that they had changed something where you could either they were let you have more or less but uh, most of them, it's really hard to come up with five modifiers <laughs> reasons to use them this one here it's difficult to think of a scenario almost that you would use it but why do they have the you know they talk about it because it does happen and and again the proper use of modifiers makes a huge difference, not only in the reimbursement, but also for the statistics to state how we use the codes. 
All right, let's look at modifier 78. That's unplanned return to the operating procedure room by the same physician. Now, notice I made small other qualified healthcare professional. Just don't even read that part. That is just, it, of course, we know other qualified healthcare professional. Uh, okay. Uh, <clears throat> following initial procedure for a related procedure during the post operative period. So, again, the key is that it's in the post lot post-op period and it's related to the procedure. Now we had a um, particular, we did Q&A webinars in the past and you can find a lot of those out and clips of those on our YouTube channel, but we had done one on Modifier 78 and what I put in italics here is what Jennifer, our billing expert, had stated. I'm going to actually show you that answer sheet that's up in the club for our club members to see the, the question that was asked and how it was answered. But Modifier 78 is used for emergencies and sometimes you have complications or problems with uh, a previous surgery and then they have to return or um, they ha they have to make some changes. Now if that's the case and the example she gave was cardiac catheterization, a laser suite, endoscopic suite, they can't take place anywhere else right? And so that's why you have to go back to that particular area. So let me show you the scenario that we talked about because we we used to do these all the time and they're all up in, oh, no, that's the wrong one. I apologize. Let me find it here. Modifier 78. So this is the answer sheet that um, our club members got to see. The question had come in, I'm getting confused when to use modifier 78 and 79. And she says, one of our EP uh, physicians does a loop recorder and then a week or two later the patient needs an ablation. Uh, does this call for a 79 or a 78? She said the code that we use is I48.1, which is I50 is heart failure. So it's right before that. There's uh, I'm trying to remember what I48 is. So again, she reiterates what uh, 78 is for unrelated or unplanned related procedure. And then this is the information that I took that I added to our slide deck. But she goes on to give some sources. And she said the difference is modifier 79 is unrelated procedure or service by the same physician during the post-operative period, whereas 78 is unplanned related procedure. So uh, again, uh, when you use the 79, it's when you have another procedure that's not anything related to the original condition to the surgery. Uh, and uh, the example, she says, a patient with knee surgery falls and breaks their wrist. Then again, that's not related. They're still in the global period, but it's not related to the original one. And who's going to fix it? The orthopedist. Why is the orthopedist going back to the OR with the same patient? and doing a similar, you know, something to do with a fracture. Ah, well, because um, <clears throat> they uh, are an orthopedist and they fell, you know, so you have to have a modifier to explain, no, this wasn't planned or related. And then they go in to explain what a, a loop recorder is and what CMS said uh, and some more resources uh, uh, for, um, for this particular type of procedure. So again, this is something that we have in our club. Uh, we have a recording of this transcribed, what happened and, and questions that were given to us that we'd go and we'd research and now we do them. Uh, we don't do them all in one night uh, where we could only do like six questions at a time. We just do like three nights a week <laughs> with this. So anyway, I wanted you to see that and how we answer those questions. So that explains 78 and also gives you some insight on 79. Um, let's see. And we've got links up there to, oh, I48, AFib or Flutter. Thank you, Sandra. Yeah, I knew. I kept thinking I should have this one memorized. This is going to be one of those ones that it's like I know I50 is heart failure, CHF. Uh, what's I48? It's like it's got to be something to do. <laughs> All right. When you've been doing this so long, you can't help but have them memorized, right? So let's go to our next, oh, sorry. 
let's go to the modifier grid. I want to talk about the modifier grid a little more in depth now. Um, let's go back to the main page. And I don't know, let me see. I was thinking I can make this all big for you, but I guess I can't. Let's no. Okay. So this modifier grid is something that you can actually print off and a lot of people go ahead and laminate it front and back uh, on one paper, paper so that they can do it, use it as a reference. Now you can't take this in with you if you're going to test, but this will really help you understand the ways the modifiers work, both because you have the description, what's the purpose, and what does it do. So let's kind of break those down. So I encourage you after this webinar to go to the cco.us site, download the free uh, CPT modifier grid, and if you're in the club, it's already in the club for you, and probably a lot of also, you'll find a lot of um, lectures where we talk about modifiers. This was brilliant. Lorraine came up with this some time ago, and I, I tell you, it's one of, in fact, <clears throat> She started this way back when I was teaching in a college in, in Texas, and my students weren't getting E&M. And I couldn't figure out what I needed to do to explain it. I mean, obviously, I wasn't explaining it well enough to them. Uh, uh, so I that's when I found Laureen online. And these YouTube, I said, go watch her YouTube channels, you know, watch her videos. She explains it so well. And so we started using, using that. And then we found the modifier grid that she had done. It's like, OK, this is brilliant. This is exactly what you need to explain. I've never seen anybody explain it any better than what she does. So again, here is the uh, types and the uh, abbreviation for what's the type the modifiers used for, and then what is the the purpose? Okay, it's going to make if the arrow goes up, it means that that modifier is going to have an increase in revenue. If the modifier or if the arrow just goes leans off kind of uh, sideways, then it uh, means the claims doesn't get paid unless you use this modifier. Without it, you're going to get a denial. And then if it's down the very easily it means reimbursement is going to be lowered and then if it goes lateral from to side to side it you know it's just an informational modifier and uh, everything stays the the money stays the same it's not going to increase or uh, decrease the reimbursement but it needs to be there for informational purposes and then what she did was um, she gave the you know which ones are ENMs, which ones an anesthesia which one's surgery radiology path and lab medicine uh, uh, surgery centers and hospitals okay so if it's listed there then you'll know it's pertinent for that modifier now we looked at the first one modifier 24 notice that it has an angled arrow which indicates hey if it's not there the claim's not going to get paid. It's going to be denied, all right? And it's only used on EMs, and it affects EM and global packages. It's a global package modifier. Now, everything we just talked about uh, and explained that we kind of broke that out and, ex and explained it. Now, I again, I didn't go through all the modifiers because it would take us all night to get through them, but. This teaches you how to use the modifier grid, which is a free tool for you. And I really encourage you to uh, use it as well as give it to your providers, right? Anybody that you know that is working in coding, any students uh, or, or your providers to let them help them understand the modifier usage. All right, let's just kind of glance through some of these others. Another one that is used for EM, but it's also used for medicine, notice right here, is decision for surgery, modifier 57. Okay, now there's specific guidelines around modifier 57. And <clears throat> um, what you need to be aware of is that Decision for surgery can only be done at a certain time, 
right? And it will um, not make a, a change in the reimbursement per se, but you're not going to get paid for that decision in surgery if you don't append modifier 57, okay? So it's a GP and an ENM. It's used on ENMs and medicine section. Uh, 58, stage your related procedure, only global package, same arrow. But look, you'll be using that with surgery, radiology, medicine, and in hospitals uh, and stuff. So we're not going to go through every one of these. Let's skip down to modifier 25 because we also spoke about that. It is one that is very commonly used uh, it, it's a significant separate identifiable e E&M service. So when your patients come in for their annual wellness visits for Medicare, then and they decide to give them their flu shots, modifier 25 will be added to that because the annual wellness visit isn't you're not supposed to have anything wrong with you. Now <clears throat> this is used uh, on E&Ms and it's used in hospital, uh, and notice that you're not going to get reimbursed without it. It uh, has more than one global package, e and m and the BUN, which stands for, uh, it's bundled, bundling. Professional component. You almost are guaranteed to see this on any of the uh, credentialing exams. This is probably the most used and tested on modifier. All right, so modifier 26, professional component. This is uh, going to bundle and it, it will decrease reimbursement and it's not used on E&M and anesthesia but it's pretty much used on everything else except for hospital ancillary surgeries. So the example for those that they usually give you is that a uh, patient has an x-ray and they have an x-ray at <clears throat> the um, x-ray machine. Does it belong to the provider? Is it owned by him and his clinic? Or is it owned by the facility that he works out of? And if it's owned by the facility that he works in, then he's only giving a professional component. He's reading the x-ray. So a modifier 26 would be applicable, right? Whereas if you went in to your PCP and he owns the clinic, he owns all the equipment in there, it's his x-ray machine, and he pays the technician to... Uh, take the x-ray and all the electricity that's used in the light bill and he reads it well then you're not going to use a mo modifier 26 he does more than the professional component for that all right uh, let's see we already talked about modifier 25 so let's scroll down to some of these others notice that we have um, uh, mandated services that gets a little confusing modifier 32 it's an other right? doesn't fall into the other categories, but it could be one that you're not going to get paid for it if you don't use the modifier, or it may make no changes, but um, it can be appended to almost everything. Mandated services are things that are like court ordered. So a court ordered uh, test for paternity would be uh, uh what they usually use as an example, the easiest one. Uh, let's look at modifier 50, another very common, probably the most common after modifier 26, uh, bilateral procedure. It's an other. It increases reimbursement and it's used for surgery, radiology, medicine, and hospital. Well, uh, <clears throat> it makes sense, surgery, if we're going to do um, bilateral mastectomy. Right? There isn't a code for bilateral mastectomy. There's a code for a mastectomy and the different types of mastectomy. But if you take both breasts, it's a bilateral mastectomy and you have to use a modifier 50 to indicate that both breasts were removed. Okay. Uh, reduced services and discontinued services. A lot of confusion about that. And that's one that I would encourage you to study is reduced services means that, hey, we didn't, um, we didn't end up doing what we planned to do. Discontinued is that um, 
we had to stop. Something happened. Uh, the anesthesiologist said the patient's not doing well. We need to stop the procedure. So it was discontinued. Whereas reduced services were, um, we were uh, something that's normally done bilaterally. And it's not done bilaterally because you don't have the laterality. You're missing whatever the other thing is <laughs> to give it laterality um, would be an example. Rosanna says, let's see, if someone comes in for a wellness visit and they also are being seen for a headache, but no x-ray or other services was done for the headache, would the patient still need an E&M for the headache? <clears throat> if they're coming in for a wellness visit where they're not supposed to have anything wrong with them, that's what a wellness visit is, then yes, they would do another E&M for the headache if they do anything to treat the headache. They don't have to do an x-ray. They don't have to do anything. They could just do a soap note, right? Why, why are you here? Uh, are we, what's the problem? I have a headache. Then they ask them, well, when did it start? Uh, how long does it last? Does anything make it better or worse, et cetera, et cetera, you know, and then the provider looks in the ears and says, no, you know, it, so again, yes, they would need to do an E&M for that additional service because they're there for an annual wellness visit. Some providers won't do it. They will say, well, you have to make another appointment, which is kind of sad. <laughs> <laughs> Especially after travel. Um, now, there was a question on vaccines. Let me look at that real quick. Scroll up right before Roseanne's. And that was Elizabeth says, I think I missed what you said about the flu vaccines. Can you repeat that? If a patient comes in for their annual wellness visit, every if you're on Medicare, every year you have to have an annual wellness visit. And Again, you're not expected to have anything wrong with you. You're just establishing the diagnoses that the patient has and kind of giving you a starting point of the patient's health and care at that moment in time. And you want to maintain or get better, improve. Uh, but the that's a great time for the provider to say, hey, did you get your flu shots yet? You know, have you had your um, your your flu shot, your pneumonia shot, and now they have the um, shingles, shingles shot. So then uh, they will go ahead and do those, and that's separate. That's That would be uh, a separate identifiable scenario. Uh, do you use modifier 50 as CPT description, say bilateral? No, you do not, Jane. Very good question. If they have like if a person goes in and has bilateral knee replacement which they do do sometimes the code states that you know a knee replacement and there's more than one type of knee replacement but if they do both knees that's bilateral knee replacement you would use that code and then modifier uh, 50 to state that it was bilateral uh, let's say they're removing an ovary now when they go in and they take out uh, they do a uh, histo ufu forectomy. It's salpingo, a histo salpingo ufu forectomy. That means they're taking out everything. Histo is the his, uh, is the uterus. Salpingo is the fallopian tubes, and oof, and you go oof oof because there's two. You have two ovaries. Um, that is bilateral. Now, my mother had that done at a very young age because she had uh, what we were talking about, endometriosis, really bad. And so they, because she was younger, they took everything out, but they left one of her ovaries, a piece of her ovaries. So it wasn't a, uh, a, sal, uh, a histosalpingo oophorectomy, not a uh, oof oophorectomy, right? That they take out too. So laterality, it, you know, is involved there because if they're going to take them out, they usually take both out, right? So the code it, for the removal of an ovary, uh, you'd have to go look at it, but it probably says, you know, bilateral or sometimes they'll say single or multiple by, or, you know, bilateral in there. Donna says, there is a scenario, 67221 to be followed by uh, 225, this second I why not right and left uh, modifiers used here? Well, okay, you could use right and left. The codes are written for, um, again, statistical. We have to remember it's statistical. It's not originally to get paid. And 
ha the reason they make a code is because the scenario happens often. And so a code for laterality with the description laterality built into the code description will be used because it's used so often or that scenario like you're talking about. Uh, and you could use right or left, but again, RT and LT is used by Medicare. And um, so if it's not a Medicare patient, then you're going to use modifier 50 for laterality or use the two separate codes. Yeah. Uh, when you code CPT 99253, I don't have that code memorized. You'll have to tell me what it is, or I'll, Vanessa, or I'll, I can use the encoder to look it up. Um, let's see. We've Sarah, Sarah said this is a, had an increase in denials with UHC. They want to see anatomical modes for ears and hands. You know, I'm not surprised about that with UHC, Sarah, because. Um, Last year, there was a huge influx in ear coats. Now, I don't know about hand coats, but there were, um, yeah, there was a, a lot of changes where additional ear coats and hearing coats and procedure codes for the ears were added uh, uh, in ICD. And so, uh, and, and thus, I, and CPT as well. So uh, again, I'm, I'm not really surprised to see that that they're wanting uh, anatomical modes for, for those type of things. Yeah. Okay, 99253, I'll look that up real quick because I just happen to have an encoder. And then uh, inpatient consultation for new and established patient, which requires these three key components. Now, keep in mind that, um, yeah, you, Donna says UHC is a tough customer, frequent denials. Yeah, they are. <laughs> uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield isn't much farther behind. Uh, okay, so with this one as an inpatient consult, I would look at my notes. And uh, again, they don't pay, for, a lot of them don't pay for consults. But this is an inpatient consult. Um, CMS has eliminated the use of all inpatient consults. So, uh, <clears throat> um, when you code 99253, what they end up having to do, if the payer won't pay for it, you use the regular E&M codes, established patient or new patient. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, you just follow those. And there, um, you or if you were asking me about modifiers appended to that, that is that is classified as a as an E and M uh, a consult. I know modifier ninety five is for telehealth videos, right? Yeah, it is. Uh, let's look at modifier ninety five and synchronous uh, synchronous. Uh, telemedicine services rendered via real-time interactive audio or video uh, telecommunication visit. Yeah. So um, real-time interaction between physician telecommunication. Yeah, you know, there we did, a, we had a lot of um, education that we did on televisits right at the beginning of the year, I'd encourage you to go look at our YouTube channel, Medical Coding Cert, regarding that because there were, uh, you know, everybody was trying to get up to speed. Some of this stuff has been around, but we didn't use it very often. And then when COVID hit and we all had to use it, everybody was scrambling to understand the nuances. And then they made changes almost daily <laughs> for Medicare patients. So uh, yeah, I would, in, I would encourage you to go and look, um, look at some of those that break those uh, modifiers down and the telehealth. Very good, guys. We did good tonight. Um, Elizabeth says, I'm trying to find the modifier sheet and can't locate it. There was a link placed in the chat, but I'll just show you how to go find it real quick. Let's just go ahead and do that. And sometimes visual. Go to cco.us. Hey, we got a sale going on. Uh, freebies. And then we break down all the freebies. There's the free exams, the reports and guides, and it's a tool. And it's this tool uh, right here. There's six tools there, and it's the uh, upper right-hand quadrant, Get Your Modifier Decision Grid Job Aid Tool. 
and you can click on that you fill out this and then you'll be able to download that um, okay and then let's see we had a couple more questions um, do you have an do you have to add modifier 25 to CPT 99497 when you have an ENM CPT 99497 let me just put it in I am I am not quick with um, CPT codes ICD I have a lot of those memorized but CPT is uh, I don't work in that world as much and so I um, would, would struggle to have those off the top of my head. Advanced care planning including the explanation discussion of advanced directives and you want to know if you would append modifier 25 I don't think I would Um, well, you could. Yeah, I guess you could. It's an E&M. So if you do a, an E&M at the same time and do 99497, yeah, you could. I believe so. Not 95. You could use GT, but 95 probably is. Um, oh, oh, E&M. Yeah. Uh, ooh, 99253, a lot in vascular. Um, yeah vascular surgeries. You're right, Deborah. It's used a lot. Hmm. Uh, then do you append modifier 20 to an EM visit for 213? Uh, okay, 99213 is a uh, uh, established patient, level 3, and 36415. I don't have that one memorized. I gotta look at that one. Collection of venous blood. Um, <clears throat> you know, Okay, um, no, probably not, uh, because isn't it common for like an annual wellness? Um, no, collection of venous blood is is not separate. It's not above and beyond what you're you're doing and you're treating for that patient. It's uh, I don't think you would do that. Um, I could be wrong. I'd have to double check with Jennifer, but I don't think so. What does it say here if it says anything about that? No, because I mean they they have to take blood to to do lab tests. Oh, now if they send it off to LabCorp, um, that could be different. There is a modifier where you're sending it off to another lab. Uh, I have to do some more research. I know we've talked about it. In fact, I know we have things uh, in both the club regarding this. Jennifer's talked about it and probably on our medical coding cert. So let me let me defer to that, Belle, because um, off the top of my head, I, I would uh, not want to tell you. Uh, uh, yeah, modifier 90, reference lab, that's what I'm thinking of too. You're right, now that you said that. Reference outside laboratory. That's the modifier that you would use. Path and lab right here. Thank you guys, Donna. Yep. Uh, we did not use modifier 25. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was going to say, I just don't think, I think drawing labs is a regular component of even an annual wellness visit because they, they'll do your labs to see how, uh, uh, how you're doing. Yeah. And you can check your NCCI edits for that. Absolutely. And uh, in fact, you can go in like here and I have NCCI edits. I have it somewhere in here. There it is. And then I would say non-facility and then it would tell me the ones that you can and cannot put together. Yep. Find your code has just about everything I would ever need. Uh, no modifier needed. Okay. From uh, family. Okay. I'm thinking FM family medicine and I am. We didn't use 25 unless injections or in office procedures. Right. Injections is different. See, you're going to give them a flu shot. You're going to give them a shot of an antibiotic because they have um, um, uh, cellulitis on their leg. 
you know, so they come in for their regular visit and they, um, you end up giving them, you know, a shot of Benadryl or a shot of antibiotic and you send them home with a script. Okay. That's not why they were there. Right. So you would definitely use, uh, or they get their flu shot you use modifier 25 to indicate that. Yep. All right, guys, thank you for joining us. I know we covered a lot of content tonight. Let me just get rid of these screens and get back to our, um, the end. And remember, we are here every Wednesday night for students. Uh, then you can, uh, our students send in things that they're struggling with or scenarios that, uh, we know that it's a good teaching uh, moment that we can share with every fun and we just invite you along. Uh, you're welcome for the freebies and the Q&A webinars. Uh, uh, all of our students get that all this stuff gets loaded in for additional content for our students. But your great questions help and some of your insights because uh, um, some of these things for CPT, like I said, uh, first one to tell you, that is not my world uh, to be able to rattle that stuff off the top of my head. You throw the ICD and now I'm, I'm, I can hold my own with that. Uh, but thank you for the I-48 reminding me that that was AFib and arrhythmias. That, I, uh, it was on the tip of my tongue. Uh, so tomorrow we'll be back, uh, most Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. We'll, uh, we'll be here live. Don't forget to hit the like button for us if you're watching on YouTube. That really helps us, guys. Uh, so I would appreciate you doing that. That uh, lets YouTube know that we're um, we're a site that is helping people with our content. And um, uh, again, don't forget you can share these and hit the little bell so that you know when we're going to come live. And if you join the club, we let you know. Uh, we'll send you out an email to give you a heads up. So again, thanks everybody. Appreciate it. Do you need more medical certification and business training? Learn more at www.cco.us.